Welcome to our second video on the free and open source default game engine. In this video, we will start to take a look at the building blocks of creating a game for the engine. To make it easier to understand the main difference between the different engines that we are covering, we have thought of implementing the same game with the resources. Since in GDevelop we have already started to put the foundations on a new platformer for the Melee tutorials, we have decided to use it too in default. There so, in this tutorial, we will import all the assets for the level, player, and enemies, we will create a first draft level, and implement a basic movement that will allow us to control our player character. Let's dive into default. First thing, let's create an empty project. Let's create the main folder for our resources, where we will be keeping all the files associated with the different elements in the game. We are calling it resources, but you can call it as you want. Let's create two subfolders, one of the environment or level, and the other ones for the sprites of player and enemies. Now, from the folder where you have downloaded your assets, let's drag them into the folders just created. We are starting with the sprites for the player and for the enemy. Two new folders are created for each of the sprites imported. Afterward, repeat the action for the tileset to be used in creating the level, that should go under the environment folder. If we browse through the hierarchy, we can see that all the files have been imported. Before starting to implement the main elements of the game, and since we are dealing with a pixel art project, let's make some adjustments to the project proprieties, to guarantee that everything will work correctly in the game. For that, open the main folder, and double-click in the game.project which is holding the global proprieties of the project. It is where we can configure the name of the project, the starting collection, the game viewport, the physics, and much more. In our case, we want to go to the display and configure it to be 1024 in width and 768 in height, this allows us to have the right ratio for our pixel art assets. Then, scroll down to the options named Graphics, and in the default textures filter fields, set both to nearest. This will make sure that our sprites will not be blurred when dealing with different sizes. Save by pressing Ctrl or Command S depending on if you are on PC or Mac, or by going to the menu if you don't like to use hotkeys. Let's close the window and let's start creating our level. Open the Castle Tileset subfolder in the Project Content pane. Right-click on the tileset name and from the contextual menu choose the option to create a new tile source. This will allow us to start to configure the way our tileset needs to be processed to be able to generate later on the tile maps. Without creating this source file, Default will not allow you to access the art assets. We are naming it Castle Tileset, 
but feel free to name it as you want. Click on the button Create Tile Source. You can see that the main window is now opened into the tile source, but it is empty. This is because we have not yet told the tile source what tileset it should be using. In the right pane, you can see that the inspector is displaying the main options for the object and that it is currently highlighting the filed image, which is basically the tileset that we want to use. Click on the button with the three dots, and it will open a new dialog, with a listing of all art assets recognized by default, and that we have imported earlier on. Look for the tileset, and double-click to choose or click on the button OK to close. As soon as you do it, we can see that the main screen changes, but still doesn't show anything. This is because most of the time, default zooms too much by default. Zoom out using the mouse wheel, and you should start to see the tileset to be used. In our case, since we are using a 16 by 16 pixels tiles, which is coinciding with the default configuration from default, we don't have problems. If yours has, try to adjust on the right pane the number of pixels and the width and height. Now, to be able to use it, we need to create a tile map that will allow us to use each of the different elements in the tileset to paint a level. For that, Right-click again on the folder name and choose the option to create a new tile, Map. In our case, we are going to call it Level 1. As in the previous step, the Level 1 tile map is opened in the central window, but nothing is shown and if you try to do anything, you are not able to do anything. This is because, just like for the tile source, we are not setting what is the resource that needs to be used to create the tile map. In the right pane, you can see a red box asking to define the tile source to be used. Click on the three dots button and select the castle tile set tile source. Zoom out until you are able to get a good view at the axis Y and X which defines the coordinate 00, 0 of the game world. In the right pane, you can see that associated with the tile map, we can create layers. Let's rename the one created by default to be Game. When you click on it, you can see that there is a brown area that becomes active in the central window. If you press the spacebar, you will be shown the tile set imported and you will be able to choose the different tiles and start painting them on the canvas. Let's paint a quick level.
Default doesn't allow you to choose several tiles at the same time from the tile set, but once you have painted them on the tile map, you can select several of them and create a kind of virtual brush that will allow you to reuse different sections of your map. One thing to be taken into consideration is that everything that we have done up to now, is not yet visible in our game. If we go to the main folder and open the main scene or collection, you will see that there is nothing. This is because we have not yet created any game object which are the elements that default us to build the game. So, let's create our first game object. In the main collection window, let's right click in the collection displayed in the right pane. Click on add new game object. Immediately, you will see a new object created in the hierarchy, and an empty object will appear in the game world with its translation arrows to be moved around. Right-click again in the outline view on the game object. Choose the option Add Component File. In the dialog box choose the level 1 tile map that we have just created. Look in the central window and you should have the tile map now painted on the screen. Save with Ctrl or Command S and run the game with Ctrl or Command B. You can see that you have your level on the screen. Let's repeat these actions for the player sprite. Let's first rename the folder with the sprites that we will be using for the player as player. Since the sprites that we are going to use are based on different images, and not in a tile set, we are going to use a sprite atlas to hold all the sprites. For this, right click on the player folder and choose the option add atlas. Set the name to player, or another name you want. A new window with no content will open. In the right pane, under right click on the Atlas option to start adding images. Since our player has different animations, we will group them under an animation group that initially we will be calling idle and that will hold all the idle sprites. Below the ID or name, you can see an FPS option that is currently set to 60. Let's decrease it to 12 frames per second. Right click now on the idle animation and click on the option add images. In the new pop-up window, choose the images that you want to add to the animation. In our case the idle sprites. You can choose one by one, or shift select multiple sprites. Click OK to close. The purpose of Sprite Atlas is to improve the overall efficiency of the graphics rendering as they are transferred into the GPU much easier and faster. To use the atlas, we need to create a sprite. So, let's right click again on the player folder and choose add sprite. Name it as player. In the right pane, in the outline view, you can see that there is now a sprite element. Below, in the inspector, there is an image option that is highlighted. Click on the button with the three dots and select our player atlas. In the default animation, choose the idle animation. The window changes. And if you zoom out, you can see our player sprite in its idle pose. If you press the spacebar, then you can see the character animation played. This will allow us to fine-tune some of the parameters associated with the animation. As for the tile map, everything that we have done for the player will not be seen in the game, until we create a new game object and bring all the elements into it. In this case, 
instead of creating the game object directly on the main collection, let's create it on the project files. This will help us create a prefab that can be later instanced in the scene view, or dynamically via scripts. So, right-click again on the player folder name, and choose the option Add New Game Object. Name it Player and click on the button Create Game Object. Again, an empty window is open. And in the right pane, you can see the root game object. Right-click on it, and choose the option Add Component from File. Choose the player sprite. Zoom out to see the full sprite. Drag the sprite up as to put it on the coordinates X0 and Y0. This will make the pivot to be located at the feet of the enemy. Let's open now the main collection window, and let's bring in from the file the new player game object. Move it to be on top of the platform. Although the game is in 2D, you can see that we have a Z coordinate that will allow us to place different elements in front or behind ones and the others. Let's save and run the game. And we can see both our platform and our player. But, maybe somewhat too small. We have two options to solve this. The first solution would be to directly scale up the assets. This could be a temporal solution, but the problem that it would generate is, that, we would have to scale up everything from this point on. The best option would be to have the camera zoom modified. There are several ways to do it, but for now, we will make a quick fix, that will also help us understand how default works. By default, we have a default camera that is configured through a specific option that can be found in the project hierarchy under the folder built-ins. Look for the render subfolder and open it. You will see different options with the default render name. You can see that default render points to the default render script. Let's open it, and we have our first view of what a Lua script looks like quite frightening at the first sight. But there are some hidden gems inside. You can see that there are several functions with default projections, which means that there are already the right modes for us to use. We only have to tell default which is the preferred configuration. Scroll down until you found three commented lines starting with message post. In default most of the configuration changes or parameter receptions are done through messages. You can see that one of the lines has the option to use fixed projection with a zoom parameter. Uncomment the function by deleting and let's set the zoom value to 4. Let's save and run the game. And black screen. When we zoomed in on the camera, at the same time we are narrowing the field of view, so we have to reposition the objects. Let's move the player and tile map until we can get both on screen. There it is. Let's deal with the physics now and have our player to be able to interact with the different objects on screen. Let's move it up a little bit, as to have more time to see what happens. In the player object in the project folders,
add a new component, and choose the collisions object. You can see that by default the system is set as dynamic. This mode is a mode where the object is fully interactable with all colliders in the scene and is affected by the standard gravity of the physic engine. If you click on the drop-down button, you can see that the other options are kinematic, static, and trigger. Kinematic where the object is movable and interacts with other colliders, but is not affected by gravity. If you want it, then you have to implement it in your code. We will start by using the dynamic mode to fine-tune the system, but when coding movement we will shift to kinematic as it is more flexible. Let's continue. Right-click on the collision object and click on the option Add Shape. We have three options here, Box, Capsule, and Circle. Only Box and Circle will work in this 2D mode. The capsule is reserved for 3D elements. Let's choose the box shape. Resize it to fit the character. We are not limited to just one collision shape, we can use any number, but in our case, one is sufficient. Save and run the game. The player starts to fall very slowly to the ground. And finally when touching disappears behind it. That was expected as we have not set a collider for the tile map. Let's do it now. For this, in the project hierarchy, let's look for the tile source that we have created at the beginning of this tutorial. In the central window, you can see the tile set, and in the right pane, under the proprieties, you can see that we have an option called collision. This field is used to tell what is the basic element that the system has to use to define the collisions, in our case each tile. So click on the three dots button, and select again the tile set that we have used to create the tile source. You can see that immediately the central window changes to reflect all the tiles bordered in white, which means that no collisions are set. Let's click on the object name default, which is the collision controller, and rename it to ground. Now, let's zoom into the tiles and click on the cells you want to have the collider. As you click on them, you can see that they are highlighted with a green border. Once all the tiles are selected run the game. You can see, that although we have defined the colliders on the tile set, the player is still not colliding with the tile map. This is because, we have set the definition of the colliders, but we have not integrated them with the physic engine. For that, we need to adjust a couple of things. First thing, on the player. Go to the player object, and under the collision object, you will be able to see at the bottom of the inspector two options called group and mask. Group is similar to layer masks in Unity and other game engines. It groups colliders in a common group that can be then checked against other colliders to see if there is interaction. In the mask field, we set the other groups of colliders for which we want to interact. So in this case, the group is player, and the mask is ground because we want to check the collision between player and ground. Be careful at this point, when defining the mask, as it needs to be exactly the same as the ID that you have used when defining the collider it on the tile map. So in our case, we had to change the name to ground without a first capital letter. Let's implement the collision for the tile map now. Open the main collection window, and under the outline view in the right plane, select the tile map and add a collision object. This will tell the physics engine, that it needs to take into consideration this object too. For the tile map, we don't need to add a collision shape, because we have already one defined with the tile set, 
so we only need to tell the collision object, where the collision shape is located. So, in the field, collision shape, select the tile map. In the group field, we are going to use it as the ID ground. And then in the mask, we are going to tag the player. In the collision type, replace dynamic with static, as we don't want our level to start falling. Let's save and run the game. And we can see that our player is not bouncing on the platform. We can try to solve this by fine tuning the mass and the reflection. But don't spend too much time on it, because we are going to use the kinematic type for the movement. Movement is similar to other engines, with some differences, mainly associated with the inputs, that in other engines are already defined, and that in default needs to be created. Let's do it. In the project hierarchy, open the input folder, and double-click on the the game binding input file. A new interface will open, where we are required to make the binding of keys and actions that we want to use. In our case, we are going to define three bindings for left, right, and jump, associated with the left cursor, right cursor and spacebar keys. Once done, let's go to our player game object and set his physics to be kinematic. To be able to make the player move, we will finally need to bring our first Lua script, but don't be afraid, we will start by using one from the standard tutorial of default that we will be customized as we go along, and that will allow us to start understanding the language. The URL for the tutorial will be in the description. But first, in the player folder, let's create a new script and call it player script. Open it by double clicking and paste the code from the platformer tutorial. If we would try to run it, we would have a lot of problems, because some of the elements that are defined in the script are not present in our character. So we need to modify the script to be able to bring it along with the tutorial as we progress. Go to the top of the script. You can see, that we have several local variables that are holding the value of a hash function and a name. In default, most of the parameters that are transferred from the global system into the code for the game are done through hash tables to guarantee security. In this case, the parameters that are being transferred are the names of animations. In our case, for now, we only have the idle animation, 
so replace all the animations to idle. Next, we have four variables starting with an input prefix, which means that they are holding the reference to the key bindings that we have just done. So make sure the name on the inputs is equal to the actions that we have defined during the input binding step. As in all platformers, we need to flip the sprite depending on if we are going right or left. The flipping in Lua is done by referencing the sprite component referring it by its name. So, in the case of the example, it was named as sprite, and in our case, we are using the player name. Therefore, we need to adjust that reference from hash sprite to hash player. Finally, we need to set our ground collision, so in the variable group, obstacle replace the obstacle reference to our ground. The rest of the code is pretty straightforward and very easy to understand, but we will make it more hours as we progress in the next videos. Once the script is saved, we need to add it to our player game object. Select it in the player project folder, and right click on the root object in the outline view. Select add component from file and select the player script that we have just created. Let's save and run the game. And we can walk left and right, we can jump. There are some details to adjust as to make it more polished and more in line with what we would be able to find in a platformer, but this is a very good start. In the next episode, we will be integrating the animations and the first enemy. We hope that you have liked this video. If it has been the case, consider subscribing, giving a like, and clicking on the notification button. If you have any questions, problems, or comments, don't hesitate in putting a comment and we will answer as fast as we could. See you in the next video game developers.